everybody and welcome to Mayan's annual LL lecture. It's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, we will be hearing words from Avi Rokov, which I'm very excited for this year. I think it will be wonderful. Uh, it's a very interesting time in our calendar in terms of what we hear from Tanakh when we go to shul. I was thinking about this this afternoon ahead of this year that we've had so much prophecy so much, right? Like the whole basic book of Deuteronomy was prophecy. We were hearing Moshe telling the people about what they'd done in the past and how that would affect the future. And it really feels like the template for what we see in Jeremiah or what we see in Isaiah. And then, of course, for the Haftarot, we had so many of these Haftorahs from Isaiah, also Jeremiah, these very prophetic moments. And what happens over Rosh Hashanah is suddenly we switch to this family. We switch to family stories, family dynamics, family challenges, the Akedah, and even the Haftarot. Um, we do have one from Jeremiah, but it mentions Rachel, so clearly talking about her children and crying for them, or Hannah and the pain she feels on having a child, and prophecy feels a bit at a remove. So I think it's fascinating that tonight we will get to hear about prophecy. Uh, my name is Zoe Lang, if you haven't met me yet. I'm the director of Mayan, although only for a little bit longer, so it's wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, if you have any questions, I hope you received one of our brochures with our upcoming program. Hopefully you received a source sheet for tonight. Um, you can see many of our board members are here tonight. If you have any questions, if you want to know more about Mayan, and I hope that you enjoy Avi Rakhnov. I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you very much, Can you all hear me? I don't know if the microphone is working. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for, very much all for coming. Um, uh, this is the Mayan El Elish here, and uh, as many of you know, for a good many years, the Mayan Elish here was given over to the memory and the honor of the Rosalie Ketchin El Elishal. Rosalie uh, passed away on September 11th, one year before it became September 11th. Uh, she was a founding member of Mayan, she worked for the organization, and uh, she was a dear friend to many of us who remembered her as being a highly intelligent, ferociously competent, deeply loving, and also very courageous woman, which we learned the courage of in connection with the illness with which she was beset and which she successfully struggled against for a number of years until she succumbed to it. Uh, like I'm sure many of you here, we have, Shuli and I have been making close touch with her husband, Aaron, with her uh, children, uh, Yonatan, uh, Medina, and Hillel, and her grandchildren, two of whom are named Shoshana in her honor, the elder of whom has just finished her service in the IDF, doing things that one may not ask about. And she is now a student at the Mitzal El Art School in Yerushalayim. I'm sure that Rosalie would be very proud of her, as well as of our other grandchildren, the Hazer of Baruch. How bad were the Babylonians? We'll get to that in a moment. But first we'll read Chabakot Perik Aleph Mishra Pasukhav. I have a source sheet. Please don't look at it. I'm not using it. I'm just asking for a source sheet to read Chabakot. In the name of the Kimet HaKastim, who are the Kastim? The Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were a small nation that lived in the southeast part of Mesopotamia. For a period of time, the whole nation became known by their name, and that's how it's known in Tanakh. Agoy Hamar Bahanim Ha, very uh, alliterative phrase. What does Mar mean? It means bitter. The basic, basic meaning of Mar is a bitter taste in the mouth. It has extended meanings of bitter fate, of bitter circumstance. In this case, it's translated as fierce. Um, uh, there are many words in many languages which are used primarily metaphorically, but they started out as meaning something concrete. And, um, in the case of Mar, which is a relatively straightforward one, um, understanding a bitter fate is more potent if you can actually taste bitterness in your mouth. And I'm mentioning that because one of the things we'll be doing this evening is looking at some metaphors uh, which we only know the extended meanings of because the original meaning was agricultural, not farmers, or uh, having to do with fishing. I'm just curious, are there any commercial fishermen in the house? <laughs> Not even one? All right, so there'll be something to talk about. Aulet, uh, Merchave, Aretz, and the Babylonians go across to the, the uh, vastness of the land. Aresh, uh, 
wish to know low low uh, to seize homes that are not their own. Uh, that last part sounds very straightforward. It is not uh, anything worth studying. It's not straightforward, and this is not exception. Uh, no exception. So how bad were the Babylonians? I chose this topic to sound a bit punchy, perhaps a bit provocative, uh, but I can easily imagine it being met with a sardonic retort. Oh, what an interesting question. How bad were the Babylonians? Well, let's see. They took our people into exile in Elbethel. They captured the last king of the Jews, of Hitzikiel, and they murdered his children before his eyes, before taking out both of his eyes. And oh, yes, they destroyed the Beit HaMikdash. What other clever ideas, what other, what other clever questions do you think you're going to come up with this evening? Well, in traditional yeshiva learning, if you want to have your question taken seriously, one of the better ways to do it is to convince everyone that it's not original. Uh, so a student turns to the Rebbe and says, asks a question, the Rebbe looks at uh, the student as though he has two heads, which is a characteristic response. You see, uh, I went to school in ancient anti-Diluvian times, and uh, <coughs> student-centric education had not yet been thought of. <laughs> at any rate, the next day the Rebbe comes in and says, ah, you were machavin to a Rambam. The Ramban asked a question. Of course, the student had no idea the Ramban asked a question, but if the Ramban did ask a question, being earlier than and infinitely greater than, that validated the question and made uh, the question worth taking seriously. <coughs> so in that spirit, I will, uh, I will say that, if I can figure out how to make the ah, here we go, uh, I will say the Abar Benil asked a question. The Abar Benil, uh, that's an artist tradition of him, I'll go a little bit into the uh, biographies of some of the Farshim work that you'll be going through, but you all know in general terms, I think, who the Alba Benel was. Uh, he lived around the time. Can you hear? Yeah, great. Sorry. Uh, I wasn't hearing him. Uh, he lived around the time of the, um, uh, the expulsion from Spain. Uh, he, uh, he himself was expelled from from Portugal because he bet on the Duke of Braganza. You can't hear me anymore? No, I don't hear you. We can hear you. The microphone's off. The microphone's off. Okay, very good. That's why there's a rabbi. The <laughs> battery. Okay. All right, I'll talk, I'll talk, I'll tell, I'll talk about it. Um, he uh, bet on the wrong Duke and he had to escape to Spain where he lived for a time, he left his family and his money and everything behind. He lived in a, uh, uh, a border town, and he had nothing to do but no library, so uh, he wrote Terushim. Uh, in 100 days, he wrote 400,000 words. This is without word processing or uh, voice recognition software. Um, and of course, he had no, he had no, and this is from uh, ben Sion Netanyahu's biography of the Abravanel. And uh, Abarbanel uh, did not succeed in stopping uh, Ferdinand from, oh, here we are. Uh, Ferdinand, thanks for that, from, from, from expelling the Jews, something for which Pansia and Netanyahu never forgave. <laughs> uh, at any rate, if, if you ever studied, if, uh, if you ever studied, you pass the mic. off again. Hello? <laughs> We're having technical difficulties. Okay, okay. So <laughs> He, uh, when his technique is a little unusual. Uh, he'll take a chunk of text, ask a, whole, ask a whole bunch of questions, 20, 25 questions, in the case of the Chumash, and then write an essay answering all of them. Not for people with short attention spans, but for Habakkuk, which is a short book, he only uh, asked six questions, and we'll discuss only a bit of the first one. Uh, the first question is, what is Habakkuk complaining about? Uh, about uh, what the Bukhadesar did. Halo yada, halo shama. This is uh, an elusive uh, rabbinic way of saying. This is a quotation from Yishayahu. Didn't he get the news? He was attacked Israel and Yehuda by the Rabbanat. The Jews are going to be punished because of their sins. And Hanavim, Nebu al Zevish Bakim, Uver Chavot. In English, we would say Shadow at the rooftops. In English, we would say uh, they prophesied in the marketplaces and on the streets. So how, how did he think that there would seem to be some kind of ivut hadin, some kind of perversion of justice for them to be punished? But not only that, 
כל כן שחבקוק עצמו, כי אם זה עושה, השם לא משפט שמתו, וצורו הוכיח כסבתו. On the upper left, you see in chapter 1, פסוק 12, השם לא משפט שמתו, meaning referring to Bavel, you, you set aside Bavel for justice, meaning you're, you're the instrument of God's justice. The Tzur, the Tzur Yisrael God, will hochiach Yisraelato. You established him for tohecha, for reproof. Uh, so you see in the large red letters, in Cain Oda, she hayayin nebuchadnezzar, shevet apo. What is shevet apo? What's apo? Po is not his nose, it's his anger, Haron Apo. What's a Shevet? Shevet is a rod. When you're doing Maser Behema, one cow, two cow, three cow, has to pass under the Shevet. Uh, so, not only were the Jews uh, guilty, but the, the Babylonians were appointed by God to establish justice. So what on earth is Chabot Kul complaining about? Uh, now, I'll just point out something. You see the Pasuk. The JPS translation, uh, it's the new chief that you, JPS is not so new anymore, it's uh, since 1990, and one of the general editors was not from Sarno, or Michelle, who was a founding member of the show, translates Le Mishpat Samto as a subject of contention, and Le Mishpat is a cause for complaint. So like, who's being complaining about? Who's being complained about? It sounds like Buck was the one being complained about. Here is the Koran translation, ordained them for judgment. Who's being judged? The Jews of the Babylonians. Establish them for correction. It sounds like the Apostle, according to these translations, is talking about uh, the Babylonians being the ones who were being judged and corrected, not the Jews. So my point only here, we don't have time to get into the weeds of the different translations, but the point is, it's all very well and good to have a lofty discussion about the moral order of the universe and all of that sort of thing. But first you've got to know what the words mean. And that's a very difficult thing to do, and there's no unanimity about it. So I'm not going to uh, attempt to go in detail possible, possible about that. There's no time for that. But it's really to point out that even something as fundamental as this, with, where the uh, Barbanel is asking, answering, asking a theological question, is based upon his interpretation of the Paso. It's not a question of it's being right or wrong, but it is a question that's not being the only way to interpret it. So anyway, enough of the introduction. Uh, the outline for tonight is a brief review of people who criticize God. Uh, the technical term is matiyat devarim klape mala, which means to hurl words heavenward. And they are Abraham. Everybody, tell me, when did Abraham critique God's justice? So no, right? We all know that. We'll go review it in a second. Moshe and Aaron, connection with Korah, and Leo and Avi, from which this term was applied to him by the Gemara comes, and Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a short book, only three parkim, and has left a small footprint in our liturgy. Uh, the third parak and the last puzzle of the second parak form the, the Haftarah. For the second day of Shavuot, which means that Eretz Israel doesn't appear at all. And there are very few quotations from it in the actual liturgy. What makes Habakkuk stand out is his strenuous and lengthy and detailed critique of HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the injustice that, that God is under his supervision, since he is has hashkacha, supervision of the world, that he's countenance. Then we're going to read through Habakkuk Perek Aleph, their 17th Sukkim. We'll look at most of them, but only briefly for the purpose of extracting what the critique is. And Farshim will work with our Rashi, Radan. Again, I'll go through who they are a little bit, Abar Benel, already, and the Malbin. And finally, there's a list of Habakkuk's challenges to God. Now, this is my own work, and it suffers from a number of flaws. It's uh, intellectually sloppy, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's actually a distortion of Habakkuk, and those are some of its stronger points. <laughs> now, uh, I will read it first. Uh, the Jews are suffering. Number one, the Jews are suffering. That's one complaint. We already see the problem with that, but that was a Barbanel's question. So what if the Jews are suffering? Wasn't that part of God's plan? Rasha the Tozlo, a bad people who are doing well. You notice I left out Tzadik Varalo. That's deliberate because Barbanel will explain, I'll let him explain it. 
Dovell's cruelty is excessive. Okay, everybody's cruel when they're uh, conquering the lands, but they're doing it over and above. People will lose faith in Torah or judgment. We'll get to the Pasuk. The, the words say, Al-Kain Tafug Torah. Torah will lapse. But what does Torah mean? Does it mean Torah? Or does it mean Horaah, teaching? So there are different ways of looking at that as well. But in any case, if everybody sees that everything's going wrong and Babel is winning all the time, people will say, the heck with Torah. Or the heck with the judgment that comes from Torah, however. Number five, Babel stakes a claim to a land that it does not own. Well, that sounds like a criticism, but even a little bit of thought will tell us that, like, what exactly is he criticizing? Is there ever, is there an empire, has there ever been an empire in the history of the world which did not take lands that were not their own? What are, what are, what are uh, uh, invaders supposed to do, stay home? Number six, Babel describes its success to its own god instead of to our god. And finally, Babel's success makes human life seem worthless. And I've deliberately chosen a garish color scheme, green on purple, because what I'm going to do as we go along is I'll interpose one of these. The reason it's a distortion is Habakkuk was spoke in passionate prophetic prose. He was not giving a, um, a finance committee report at the congregation meeting with bullet points. He didn't do bullet points. And also, he was not subject to the organizational norms, which would give you a good mark on a high school term paper. Or would have given it to you when you wrote term papers that didn't ask ChatGPT to do it for you. <laughs> so he didn't do it that way. It's not organized in the way we would like to think are organized. So for just for pedagogic purposes, despite its flaws, I'll throw this in as we go along so we'll see what the critiques are. All right, so let's continue. Where's ah. Latia? To throw. It means to hurl. The varim apema. That means challenging God. So the question is, as we'll see on what grounds, is the challenge particular? Is it all about us, as we Jews so often construe things? Or is some or all of it universal applying to all peoples, perhaps appealing to some universal standard of justice? So first we'll do the one that we all know, Abraham. Abraham, uh, God says to Abraham, what I can do to Saddam. And Abraham says, with monumental chutzpah, but the like, half this pet, Sadiq and Rasha, you're going to get rid of, you're going to end Sadiq and Rasha, the Hayat had Sadiq and Rasha, the same fate should befall uh, Sadiq and Rasha. Khalilullah, God forbid, so to speak, Ahmed Sadiq and Rasha, should the judge of the whole universe not do justice? Okay, is this universal or particular? Universal. It's universal. And that's the way he phrases it. Okay, now we'll move to the next one. It's a short list. Moshe and Aaron. This is a connection with Korah. And uh, God says, oh, Moshe and Aaron, you got Lou, go away from them, I mean, they take care of them. So they say to him, This is now how they would describe it. So God's source of the breath of all flesh, one person sins and you're going to do collective punishment on everyone. Once again, universal or particular. Anything more have been more universal than that? Okay, we're going to do Elio very quickly because the term Atiyah uh, Torim Plate Mala is uh, uh, applied to Elio in the Gemara in Brachot. Uh, it says, Rabbi Lazar says, Elio, Hetiyah Torim Plate Mala, Shemar, Yata Sibota et Ibama Chorane. He said to God, uh, You, 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 they're sinning because you made them. This is really, really throwing it in God's face, and as we know, shortly afterwards, Elio was recalled to headquarters. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the has the term, has the sense of hurling something with force against a solid and unyielding surface. So, it's not, you see how he translates it, he spoke impertinently. 
What a lousy translation, or how difficult it is to translate. Because in Burton, Italy, it's, it's Latinate, it's got too many syllables, it doesn't really convey any of the, of the violence of what is being implied. Okay, now, we, we know about Abraham, we know about the others too, we sort of learn that as kids and we kind of take it for granted. But that's like what happens, you know. Sometimes people of high spiritual elevation will turn to God and say, God, you're not getting this right. And that seems like a normal thing to do, or at least to expect from certain people of elevated spiritual comfort. But we don't necessarily appreciate what our own tradition has to offer until we know what other traditions have to offer. Supposing, not, for example, that this guy was your god, Zeus. Now, as you all know, Zeus is right-handed. Here he's practicing throwing thunderbolts left-handed because he wants to be good on both sides. So just imagine somebody steps up far. I have to do it in Yiddish. It sounds better. You look at it with Zeus and say, Zeus, yeah. what would you get from that? You would get a thunderbolt upside the head. That's what you would get. So, I mean, it's hard to imagine even putting the question. And in fact, there, one of the more famous ways of, of portraying how the gods behave is from King Lear. Uh, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. So it's entirely possible to be a, a, a person who looks at the world, sees what goes on, sees earthquakes, sees tsunamis, sees, sees any number of evils, and draw a not unreasonable conclusion that it doesn't matter. And I put their sport in blue because although this is a powerful and bitter image, uh, Habakkuk's image is bitterer and stronger. And now I'll come to that at the end. And I put this picture in in an attempt to ensure a certain amount of gender equality. Why should only boys be what? <laughs> okay, so now let us look at what we've gleaned from these very a few examples. Actis, Pets, Hadith, and Rasha, and so on and so on. There are principles of justice, perhaps universal, that God recognizes and considers himself bound by. And furthermore, we have to ask, can we make the same statement about Kabakuk? In other words, take the principle of Hamid Sadiq Parasha. They're both going to end. And uh, are you going to do collective punishment on people who didn't sin? It's possible to argue to God, which they did, that if these things are true, so like, what are you doing? What kind of a moral order is there if something as basic as that, that everybody can agree on is unjust, could be the case? Can you apply a similar standard to Habakkuk complaints? We've already seen that it ain't so simple in connection with the first one, namely uh, uh, that it's bad for the Jews and so on. But we'll get to the others as well. So uh, all of these questions, uh, but in all of these statements that we said so far question the moral order of the universe under God's supervision, as we believe. And if God allows any of them to be violated, this threatens to negate the moral order. And that's, so we look at this puzzle about uh, the custom and so forth. And it says, Am hamar fierce and impetuous. Who? Why do they have to be fierce and impetuous? Who cares? If they were nice or feckless, would that be like better? What is the problem about crossing the world's wide spaces? Are invaders supposed to stay home? And furthermore, homes that are not their own. That sounds like a very basic one. How is title to a land established? Now, this is not the time or the place, or I am I'm not the person, to have some sort of comprehensive discussion. But I do want to do briefly with you is show you what the Chumash has to say about it. But first I'll review with you the Mepharshi Chalakut, Rashi, who was in the 11th century, Radak, who was in the 12th and 13th, Abarbanel, probably more correctly spelled Abravanel, uh, who was in the 15th and early 16th century, and the Malbun, which is an acronym for Mayor Lebesh Ben Yechiel Mithra Visser, 
Look at when he lived. The 19th century. How did he break into the uh, Nicaragua Gulf? As we'll see, when I never looked at the Mount Lindum in my entire life until rather recently, and as we see as we will go through various quotations from him, some of the things he has to say are absolutely mind-blowing. So you'll see for yourself. Uh, just a brief uh, uh, biographical note on Maldon. He was born in Volhynia, which is now is in western Ukraine. At various times it's been in Poland and Belarus. And uh, the name Volhynia actually comes up when you want to read about the Patriots tomorrow morning in the paper, if you dare. Uh, the, uh, the lead football reporter for the, uh, for the Globe is Ben Volhynia. And Volin is Yiddish for Volhynia. It was a he heavily Jewish area, and uh, but as we will get to, he, moved, he got around. Anyway, we'll do a little history. Who was Habakkuk? We don't know. When did he live? We don't know. Yeah, that was easy. <laughs> uh, actually, the term Habakkuk, uh, some people have said that Habakkuk resembles the Akkadian word Habakkuk, which it resembles. Uh, the Assyrian word Habakkuk. Hu and the Arabic word hu hu hu. Okay, there we go. Hu hu hu. Sorry. All of them describe a garden, uh, or herb, which may be basil. I found a, a website. It was a Christian website that said "Papa Cook means insect repellent." <laughs> Not only was insect repellent spelled wrong, but also it seemed like a totally bizarre thing. Except it's actually true because basil happens to be a very fine, all-natural insect. If his parents knew that and still named him that, I got nothing to say. <laughs> okay, when did he live? According to the Seder Olam, which is attributed to the Tana Rabbi Yossi ben Chalafta, approximately the uh, year 160 of the Common Era, uh, he lived at the time of Menashe. But the Seder Olam said that less for historical reasons and more for homiletical reasons. What do I mean by that? We all know that uh, Yeshayahu was the man who was a Yahu, Yotam, etc., etc. We know that Yemiyahu was a town of Yoshiyahu. So why don't they mention a king? It must be because it was Menashe. He was a bad king. All right, maybe. But uh, we don't actually know when he was. Uh, so the scholars seem to think that he you know, was uh, around in the year 612 because uh, the Horban Bayat was when? 586 BC. So he was somewhat before. Okay, that's everything we know about Habakkuk. Now let's review very quickly uh, the reasons uh, that one can infer from Habakkuk's critiques, and then let's go through Barakal. One, the Jews are suffering. Two, Russia of Tovlo. Three, Abel's uh, cruelty is excessive. Four, people will lose faith in Torah. Five, Abel takes land it doesn't own. And six, it, it's a strive success to its own God. Finally, Abel makes success. Success makes human life seem worthless. Pasuk Aleph. Uh, no, it's not actually not Pasuk Aleph, it's Pasuk Bet. Pasuk Aleph gives an introduction. So what does Habakkuk say? I don't know Hashem Shibati, who I cry out, and you will not listen. And Zakir left Hamas. I'm quoting, I'm, I'm pleading to you about violence, and you're not saved. So Rashi says, so Kodesh, he saw the Ruach Kodesh, that the Nebuchadnezzar was going to uh, reign over the whole um, world. So the Yot made Sarah the Israel. He was going to make it difficult for the Jews. The Alzal Tayyab and Tamayan of the Palaya. And that's, uh, that's what the Chalakot was angry about. Radak says, probably the same thing, but maybe not, Avura Hamas Hanasel Israel. So basically, this is the Jews are suffering. Now, as we've already seen, that's problematic because maybe, yeah, they are suffering, but what's the complaint about? We've already heard that. Now we turn to the Malo. I don't have a shem shivati, so he says, the in Tomar, that's how the, the Tosafot begin all their questions. They are going to say, she ain't a new robe, we in the Yeshua, right? Same critique as, uh, as, uh, as uh, Barbadel. The Jews are not worthy of salvation. Hello, Ezak Elecha Hamas. My real complaint is not that you're doing it to the Jews, but they're doing it in a particularly cruel way, and this is how the Malva puts it. Hamas, well, I'm, my interpretation of what he's saying, Hamas is a category of cruelty, 
which should be unacceptable to God on its own terms. And as you see in the third line, you know why you should take care of this? From the standpoint of justice and integrity. And so in other words, what you're seeing, and this may seem like an over-interpretation, but you'll see it isn't as we go forward, but Malbim does consistently is he universalizes it. He says that the critique is not because the Jews are suffering, it's because the violence or the various things that are being done are done in a way that violates universal rules of justice. And of course it will be upon upon the Malbim to, to prove that that works. So this is, in his interpretation, Babel's cruelty is excessive. Next person. Lama Tareni Aven, the Amal, the Amal, the Tabit. Why do you make me see iniquity and look upon wrong? Says the Radak, what is it with you, God? You're seeing Abel do this, and you're, you're letting him get away with it. The whole Zel this is the part in red. What is our fundamental assumption? That God is looking after what's going on down here. Like I know already. How long do you let them, you know, let them get away with this? So this is an example of Rasha Avatotho. Malvin, he says, I see in the Vua that, you, that I see in your Vua to me that Bavel is going to succeed. Why are you letting me see this? Shall you shed Tarani's up in the Vua, since you're showing to me in the Vua, it must be that this is under your supervision. You wish this to happen. And how can it be that something this wrong could be allowed to happen on your watch? Uh, and I see, we go to the green at the bottom, I see it happening all the time. And then he concludes, once again, it's not the Jews, it's B'nai Olam, because how can Babel be getting away with this? Another example of Rosh Hashanah. Now we take a look at Abar Benel. How does Abar Benel attempt to answer his own question? Too many words on this page, I apologize. He says, first of all, I already said, we already said, we're not blaming uh, we're not accusing God because we know that the Jews were guilty. Uh, it, so his, his tuluna is not tzaddik or Allah because the Jews were not tzaddik. That's not his complaint. Rather, his complaint is the, the Rasha Vatozlo, meaning the Babel, who is the Rasha was getting away with it, because he was uh, the Rasha Machalel Kabod Elokim, the A.K.A. Yatsuri. Then he says something interesting. He says about more recent writers, I don't know what he's referring to say, said that the two complaints, Tzadik Kurala and Rasha Vatolpo, are not equivalent, at least in people's minds, in terms of the kinds of things that would make them give up on faith. What, what, what does that mean? You see in Tzadik Kurala, you say, ah, in Tzadik Kuraretz, Asher Yaseh Tov, Lo Yamta. Nobody's such a perfect Tzadik. Maybe he's not such a big Tzadik. So I'll, I'll, I'll live with that. See somebody who's a total Russia who's getting away with it, then so you can think of it as a complex person looking at Tzadik Kuralo, Russia with Toplo, and he makes his peace with Tzadik Kuralo, but it really bothers him with Russia with Toplo. I don't know about you, I find this explanation clever, but that's terribly convincing. But so I, I will move on. I'll leave it to you to think it through yourself. Pasuk Tal. I already alluded to this before. Al Kain Tafuk Torah. This is a very difficult puzzle to, to translate. Uh, you can see that the JPS translates it as decision fails, and uh, uh, Korim translation in Torah is slackened, and so uh, meaning that people will give up on Torah. The Radak says the same thing. So the Torah and what it stands for it can't be counted on, so people will abandon it. And so then the question is whether it's Torah, as in our Torah, or just Torah, ah, but it comes to the 
same thing. People will lose faith that there is a standard of justice that is molded. Now the Malbum, once again, in his by now characteristic manner, B'nai Ha'olam Tonin Metachalim The people of the world are complaining to you because they'll see that the laws are not being followed. And the Malbum is known as a master grammarian, but actually he was a very idiosyncratic grammarian. For instance, we all know about poetic parallelism, right? Aramimcha Lukaya Mela, Aramimcha Lukaya Mela, says Aramimcha, Aramimcha has two words and two ways of saying the same thing. He was having none of that. If there are two words that are apparently parallel, they have to mean something different, very much the way it happens in the Medrash. So if it says, um, Tafuk Torah and Mishpat, Torah and Mishpat have to do two different things. Torah is our Torah, and Mishpat is general law. And look, what does he say? Third line. What does Nimus mean? Nimusi in modern Hebrew means politeness. But in the in the in the, uh, the Gemara, it doesn't mean politeness. Uh, it means rules. Uh, Steins also uh, helpfully tells us that the word nimusi comes from the Greek nomos. And even if you don't speak Greek, as I don't either, you know the word autonomous, autonomos, self-rule. It means rules. It means the rules. We would say in modern times the laws of war, the Geneva Convention, the stuff that you're supposed to do even when you're fighting a war. So, uh, and then he says, these are the mishpat nimusi, shasechel machayavo, that is naturally part of people's understanding. So, like, what is he talking about? This is what he's talking about. Natural law, a system of law based on close observation of human nature, based on values and principles of human nature, that can be deduced and applied independently of legislative law. So, where does that come from? Well, it comes from Aristotle. It comes from St. Thomas Aquinas. So at this point, if you're an active member of Mayan, you're thinking, like, who is this Malcolm guy? Is he like a Moscow? Is he like an enlightener? Maybe he's a closet reformer of some kind. Maybe he's like what he used to do in the Bologna Yeshiva where they hold up a folio edition of the Talmud and they stick like a Aristotle behind it so nobody would read it see the learn. No, actually he was none of those. I'll tell you a little bit, there's too many words on this, but I'll summarize. He came from Bohemia, which is a uh, highly Jewish area, and he had a terrible personality. He had a lot of trouble holding the job, but he got a plum position in Bucharest. And he started having disagreements with the head of Fenster who ran the show there because they wanted to modernize. So he fought with them on everything. He wouldn't let them build, he didn't want them to build a choral synagogue with an organ. He didn't want, this is going to really shock me, a school where they taught secular subjects. He was having none of that. Uh, and uh, he really got into trouble with the daily inspection of butcher's knives. Let me give you some advice if you want to go into the rabbinate. Don't mess with the mashkirchen and the shot. <laughs> um, uh, so through their complaints, they almost succeeded in having him sent to prison. He was free through the intervention of Sir Moses Montefiore on condition that he leave Romania and never come back. And this is the jail that he was not in. So, uh, just a brief personal note, my father, Olaf Shalom, was active in Ashkafa, uh, in an Adam political organization which would have uh, Ashkafas that would not be private with the conflicts of interest that appertain to those. And at the time, the Shokhtan Union was led by a man named Chaim Lewarowitz, who was an active arm of the mafia. Not metaphorically, the actual mafia. Now, there are many catering halls in New York, uh, one of which my granddaughter just got married, which are Italian, and it's not a coincidence. I don't mean that they're mafia now, but better ways than something like that. Anyway, so he got out of town, and he, his, his career took a uh, hit, and he never really had a big uh, pulpit again. And one of the places he fetched up was Kherson. Yeah, that Kherson, the 
the one that's being bombed and flooded into oblivion by the Russians right now on the, on the outskirts of Crimea. Who knew that there were even Jews there? But that's what he was rallying at one point. Okay. So uh, anyway, so he's okay. That's how he got into the growth of the But he obviously was alive to some of the intellectual currents of his time. Uh, next plus so, um, uh, we look, uh, you, the Babylonians are so successful, apparently they, they like swept across so faster than anybody had ever seen, or so they remembered. Lo ta minu ki you saw that you didn't heard of it, you wouldn't believe it. So this is another example of Rosho Tokolo. Paso Bav. Now this is the one we started out with. The Merka Ve Aret, Reshek Mishkanok Lo Lo. State claim that it is not known. So we look at Rashi and Radak, and this is what they have to say. Nothing. They don't comment on it at all. It's very difficult to interpret an absence, but they don't have anything to say about the question of taking land that's not their own. So very quickly, we'll go back to the Humish. And again, I'm not trying to be comprehensive here, God forbid. Uh, there are a couple of different ways of looking at how you establish title. One is divine decree, and the other is prior settlement. In other words, if the Hood, you were there first. So, interestingly, the Torah itself mentions to both ways. At the beginning of the Torah, Moshe says to the Jews, when you get to B'nai Esav, don't mess with them. I gave it to them. Same thing with uh, Moab. We'll see on them in the next page. But then it says, there was people there before, before Moab got there. The Amim, they were very big. Seir, Yeshua, Chorim, they were there. So in other words, prior settlement, like, doesn't count. God gave the uh, title to the land. And the same thing with Amon. The Rephaim was there, the Avim, and so on and so on. Okay, now let's move forward to Shoftim, to Yiftach. Now, Yiftach, uh, was a benzona, literally, not, not an insult, he literally was a benzona. And they threw him out of town and he hung around with uh, wastrels, but they had to call him back because they were being attacked by alcohol. So he sent, uh, for a band of his background, he sent a remarkably literate and cogent uh, communique to the king of Avon, and he said, what do you want? You want your, the land? We didn't take your land. We took the land from Sino. He took your land. And then, he says, uh, never mind, uh, God gave it to us. So you think he's going to argue. Our God is the God of the world, and he gave it to us, so that's the end of the story. But that's not what he says. He says, our God gave it to us. If your God, Kabosh, gave it to you, wouldn't that be good enough? So our God gave it to us, and you should understand that the general principle that he seemed to think he held in common with the Ammonites that if your local God gave you a victory, then you get to keep it. And who lived there before was their God. Well, like all international laws, uh, or at least so it seems, uh, this was proudly ignored by the Ammonites, and Yiftah got it for his people the old-fashioned way by winning. Now, this gentleman, who may be familiar with, with the remarkably impressive pec pectorals, <laughs> He writes, since time immemorial, the people living in southwest of what is historically the Russian land have called themselves Russians or Orthodox Christians. No need to unpack this and all the distortions. They are on two appertaining. The gentleman who converted to Christianity was known as Vladimir the Great. Of course, he was the Great because he named himself. He converted to Christianity in 987. No time to talk about this in detail, just one point. Vladimir, good Russian name, yes? Mm -hmm. Or Vladimir? No, it's not a Russian name, because it comes from Valdemar. It's a Germanic Norse name, because the people who founded Kiev and Rus were Vikings who came down from the north. And he converted to Christianity probably not because the Savior came to him in a dream, because he wanted to get the, the glamour of Byzantium, so he became Christian. Okay. This is, take this for what it's worth. Nobody cares about history anyway. Uh, they don't, I mean, in terms of making political decisions. Uh, every empire, I'm quoting Professor Timothy Steiner, I'm sure it's uh, Agola, Fume, many other people, um, is, uh, 
empires make up their own um, uh, myths about how they came about. And this particular one happens to be a particularly toxic one. But America has its own, uh, its own uh, you know, empire story. It includes cherry trees, honesty, and a very nice Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> OK, now this last one I just put in last Wednesday, guys, because I simply couldn't resist. Last Wednesday, a leading religious figure issues a statement about an empire that took a land that was not its own. The Pope visited Mongolia and praised Genghis Khan. Yes, he did. First, he praised the Tsars. And the pontiff was criticized, but he was not chastened. He summoned praise for the medieval empire that took land and not its own and went all the way to Europe. And he said, this empire could embrace such distant and varied lands that it showed a remarkable tolerance. There's not my tolerance. And he said, the model we should think of is the Pax Mongolica. Honest to God, I can't, I couldn't make up something like that. I'm telling you this not only because it's really weird, but also because the idea that taking somebody else's land is an unequivocal evil is not taken for granted ad hayom yeah. To make that into a universal standard, violation of which violates the moral order, is a really tall order unto itself. Now, I'm showing Habakkuk looking, uh, looking appropriately perplexed. Let's move on. Pasuk Rav, OK. Now, here we're going to head into a very strange thing. Malum of the same puzzle says, you know what Merhave Arabs to take the land low low that he doesn't belong means? He means Dera Koshe Arabsot, the way of invaders is La Leta, La Era, Orecha Arabs, the Mizrahla Mara. The proper way to invade is east to west. The Eretz Ashayat, Yaklima Shela, to stay in the same climate. Same latitude. Who? Oh well, what is it? Sin? It went north to south. Where it not is climate. So at this point, you should have, uh, this is a perplexed Babylonian, uh, you should have two questions. One, what on earth is he talking about? And two, even if you know what he is talking about, why is he saying it? For this, we have to go to the warm waters of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, here we have Turkey, Greece, and we have the island of Kos. Just below it is the island of Rhodes. Shirley and I took a kosher cruise from Haifa, and we went to Rhodes before the forest fires closed it down. Um, and then we were supposed to go to Kos, but we couldn't because of weather conditions, so we went to Crete. Who lived on Kos? Hippocrates. The Asclepian, who really would wanted to go there to see the express, the temple of healing, and also to ask Hippocrates for his autograph. Because although it was the fifth century that he was there, they were in school, he really took good care of himself. So I thought maybe he was there. <laughs> anyway, he wrote a book called Airs, Waters, and Places. So he starts off by saying, if you want to investigate medicine properly, you have to consider the seasons, you have to consider the, the weather, you have to consider the water, and so forth. Sounds very good. But then he takes it in the following direction. He says, you know, Asia is different from Europe. And with regard to the productions of the earth and the inhabitants. In other words, not only does it differ in what you can grow there in the ground, you can also differ in what the people are like. For instance, manly courage, endurance of suffering. You're not going to find that in Asia. You won't grow there. And he says, the inhabitants of Phasis, I don't know where that is, somewhere in Asia, presumably, the Phasians have shapes different from other men, and the different habitat, ha habit of body, and also they're very cowardly. In other words, what he's doing, he's saying is, you can grow grapefruits in some climates and not others, and you can grow manly, courageous people in some, uh, in some climates and not in others, and therefore, you should stay where your climate is. Uh, 
and he says that the Greeks are now like the barbarians and so forth because of where they live. Okay. This sounds odd, but it's not as odd as it sounds like it sounds. So you figure, okay, 5th century BCE, that's how they talk then. Let's move up several centuries to the 18th century. This is the Baron de Montesquieu, one of the philosophers of the French Revolution. And this is what he had to say in the spirit of laws. When a religion adapted to the climate of one country, clashes too much with the climate of another country, it cannot be there established, and if it is established, it's discarded. So the reason that Christianity is in the north is because it's cold, and it produces people who are suited to Christianity. And it's only, and the, the Muslims are only in hot weather across the middle. Okay. That's what he said. And so you see that this idea that climate determines what people are like, what their characteristics are, not just the shape of their bodies, but the shape of their minds and souls, but also what religion they do. So you say, all right, fine, well, that's also a little bit weird, but certainly nobody thinks about that anymore after that, but then you'll be wrong again. You have to turn Leibniz around, which I'm sure such sense chills up your spine because it's associated with the Nazis. But it preceded the Nazis. Lebensraum is German for living room, room for living, but it actually means habitat. It means the place where certain groups of people can live. And it was popularized around 1901, long before the Nazis. And Hitler's plan, and at least I'm relying on Timothy Snyder's book, Black Earth on Holocaust, his plan, when he, when he uh, double-crossed Stalin and invaded, is he was, what he wanted was what we all now know is the breadbasket of Europe, which is Ukraine. And what he wanted to do was drive all the Slavs out, push them to the other side of the Ural Mountains, and starve them to death, which the Germans were actually very good at doing. They starved three million uh, Soviet prisoners of uh, war during the World War II, in addition to all the other things they did. And, um, this is a gentleman who uh, popularized that. But the point is, what he wanted to do is clear out all the slobs, bring all the good German farmers, have them set up farms to be served by the slobs, which comes from the word slave, by the way. That's what they're intended to be done by their, by their nature. Uh, and send all the food back to Germany. And in order to do that, you have to go west to east. So in other words, the Malmum statement, you don't have to buy it, but a whole lot of other people did. And I'm not suggesting that Malmum had anything to do with, 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 uh, with uh, uh, the behavior of people who acted upon ideas like this. But the point is, and I can give you examples of how people talk about eating local. And I would say to you that these, these ideas that go back to Hippocrates are there and have never actually gone away. So, I mean, you know, but, the, so, but now the question is, well, enough of that. The question is, so what? What did Melville accomplish by applying that rule to Eric's law? Eric, it's not, not, not his, not that he doesn't have title to it, but that he has no business being there. What he did was, he universalized the implications of Bubbles' badness by showing that Bubbles' expansion was uniquely evil because it violated the fundamental principles of expansionist innovation. In other words, we've already seen you can't really make a case that taking somebody else's land is a unique evil because people don't even be, you have the Pope praising Genghis Khan for God's sake, so those people have never accepted that. But on the other hand, if you violate the way people ought to behave because of the nature of people, I'm not agreeing with him in terms of the science of it, if you want to call it that, but the purpose, the moral effort he's putting into this is to show that just like you shouldn't kill a Tzadik with a Russia and still have a moral order, you can't do it that You can't allow this kind of expansion either. Let's move on. Quickly now, Ayom uh, 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 he uh, terrible and dreadful in making all the laws and rules. Rashi quotes that explains it and says, Mishpatim, Yushtitsiya Boaz. What's Laz? What's his Laz when Raji says that? Old French. Old French, right? So the question is, what is justice? I don't know how to pronounce it in Old French. You know, what do they mean by that? The point of 
hope is, is to understand the people who stayed in Torah. And basically, what it meant in Old French was that you at least knew what the rules were, even if they weren't just in the way we would use it. In other words, we think justice is fair. Everybody should have the same rule. They didn't have the same rule. Going back to the Code of Amorabi, if you, if you wounded a gentleman, you got to be paid the gentleman would, uh, would there'd be a higher fee for a gentleman at five shekels for a free man and so forth. And then, so, in other words, if there wasn't fairness in the contemporary sense, but at least you knew what the rules are. And the Malvin says the same thing. Uh, at least if you know what the rules are, as opposed to a complete tyrant, you know, I know I'm in the North Star Show, but I'll quote the New York Times, David Brooks said, tyranny is about arbitrariness. Where a tyrant has power, there is no rule of law and no governing order. So, according to this analysis, the sin is that they got rid of all the accepted rules of inter international behavior. Well, so 10, uh, the, 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 uh, they, they had such spectacular success Russia and Tokolo, because they were much, they, they simply swept across the known world, and uh, nobody had ever seen that before, and they ascribed their might to their own God. Uh, Pasuk 13, Tahore Nayim, this is the only one I can think of where that's actually in, the, in our liturgy. Anybody can tell me where Tahore Nayim is? What does it say in six days? So, like, Hail Arachnid, Chayolamim Tahore Nayim. So you're so pure from seeing Ra, and um, how can you let this be happen? So this is a repetition of the Jews are suffering. Uh, the Ramalum phrases it, Mita Tatsetik, Russia, the same thing. We don't have to repeat it again. And now, for the exciting conclusion, something fishy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do the last four Sukhim together. You made humans as though they were fishes in the sea that had no ruler. Kuloba Hakala, he fished them all up with a line. He goreyu mahermo, pulled them up in his trawl, gathered them in his net. That's why he, re he rejoices. He sacrifices to his trawl. Makes offering to his net. Cain Yorik Hermo is he then he's going to empty his trawl. So clearly, there's something with trawling that's got to do that's, that he's very fixated on. Trawling and nets and nets and trawling and over what? What is this? Fishing a fishing seminar? <laughs> what is the what is the meaning of this particular image and why is it repeated so strange? So two, two comments, Radak. Radak says, you made fishes, the aim of shale dough, therefore nobody will stop the people who catch fish, Shayim Nau. In other words, they, they, you know, they people do with fish what they want. Kena Sita Bnei Adam have care of Nezah You have left the Jews, not the Jews, the people, all people, to be hefty, to be uh, ownerless and at the mercy of this Russia. So that's one way in which the model of success makes human life seem worthless. So the question I have for you, my friends, is since none of you is in commercial fishery, what is a troll?
is that you don't want dolphins, old shoes, messages in bottles, octopuses, I don't know, whatever it is. The point being that trawling in particular requires no skill. All you do is drag and you take everything that comes. And that explains the metaphorical extension, this is courtesy of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, scenes of desperate people trawling through bins for food. What does it mean to troll through bins for food? You're so desperate, you will eat anything. So the significance of the metaphor, the meaning of the metaphor, is to troll in a way that takes everything that um, that is there. Uh, and you see what the Malvin has to say in a very powerful phrase, Atta said. First of all, this is, uh, seems to be done below Hashkatacha, You seem not to be, God, you seem not to be involved in this in any way. What you've done by making them feel like fish is you have consigned human beings to what is Mikre, fate, luck, chance. We see it in the Gilat Rut, where Rut happened upon Boaz's field by Ikar Mikre, and more to the point and more powerfully in Kohelet. Mikre b'nei Adam, Mikre Abeyma, Mikre Echalayam. The same fate, Kemotze, Kemotze. They both die in the same way. Now, I'm coming back to what I said before. Shakespeare's image is they kill us for their sport. What's a sport? An activity involving physical exertion and skill. It may be utterly meaningless, and for those of you who are not sports fans, it most certainly is utterly meaningless. <laughs> But at least you have to try. With a troll, you don't even have to do that. And so, the implication of this, pull them up all in his troll, gather them all in his net. What is the implication for human life? And in the Malcolm's phrase, that what you're allowing Babel to do makes life seem to be utterly not under your supervision and to have no point and to have no meaning whatsoever. And that is perhaps the most powerful critique of all. So the whole problem, why have this lengthy discussion? Well, I think it's of some interest on its own uh, to learn what Habakkuk's uh, complaints were because he took what Abraham Avinu and Moshe and Aaron did to, the, to another level uh, and covered in much more detail what he was critical of. But the questions that Habakkuk asked may at times, questions like them, sometimes even identical to them, but certainly similar to them, may occur even to people like us who are not of elevated spiritual stature. We may, for example, ask, why should someone admirable and estimable be, be afflicted and torn from her family, her friends, and her community in the middle of life? Why should that be? And why should a tin pot despot with a uh, half-cocked and clearly distorted national origin story and of immense malice why should he be allowed to cross into nations that are not his own and send his, send his uh, soldiers to commit atrocities and bomb granaries and hospitals and all that stuff? And if you don't like this particular example, it doesn't bother me because everyone in this room can come up with similar ones. Rahman was one from our own families or from people we know and are close to or simply from, from current events and uh, history, recent, recent and more remote, whether it's B'nai Brit, the H-A-Nun B'nai Brit, our own people and other people as well. Um, one of the things, though, 
boy said to me when she invited me to talk, she said, um, it doesn't have to be, but it would be nice if it could be connected somehow with the young men know what I am. Well, it should be obvious that that's not a problem, because in six days we're going to celebrate, or we're going to commemorate the Omadin, the day of judgment. And even calling it that implies that there is a judgment. There is a judge, and there is a judgment. Uh, and although it may be hard to discern the justice in life, uh, it certainly is something that we uh, think of, however we may construe it. Uh, I think there's hardly any of us who are not affected. I certainly, I know I certainly am, especially if Hassan is doing a good job on Yom Kippur, to read these words. Patah Anu Sha'ar, open for us the gate, the eight Elat Sha'ar, the town of the closing of the gate, Kifanai Yom, for the day is declining. However we understand this, and however we construe it, behind our understanding and beneath our construction is the belief, or at least the hope, that there is meaning to all of this, that it's not a hopeless void, devoid of meaning. And that there is a point to living, and uh, otherwise, if we don't believe that, even if we think that there might be a possibility that that's not the case, then that opens up the abyss of a life where the Surim B'nai Adam El Amikre in the Malvin's felicitous but terrible phrase, that it's all about chance have no meaning at all. But we are Jews, and that is not our belief, and it's not our lot. We gather together in the Yom and Narayim to gather strength from our community and from our tradition to have more strength than we can have individually. And we certainly have, by pooling our knowledge of what our people has been through and managed to come through, our own beliefs can lead us to what is our chalek, which is the faith that there is a point to it all and that despair is not what our people is about. And so with that, I would like to uh, thank everyone for your patience and for your listening. And I would wish all of us, which are not tovani, I encourage everybody to go home. I kept you here long enough. Go out, prepare for your dip, buy fish heads, <laughs> clean the kibble because we know that those wine stains from last day's off are not going to go away. <laughs>